Alright guys, the final score is back again and probably one of my biggest interviews so far. You know, I've interviewed Rod Woodson. I've interviewed a lot of Steelers. Everybody knows I'm a Steelers fan. But one of my favorite all-time movies, and I'm not just talking about sports movies. I'm talking about movies of all time. Came out in 1986. November 1986. Uh, by the small school, imagine that I went to a small school as well, uh, that defied all odds, went to, based and it is inspired by a true story. I have, can't say base. Inspired by a true story about a small school in Indiana going to the state championship, beating a team with a lot more students than they are. And uh, I'm talking, of course, everybody knows, If unless you've been on a rock, you've seen the movie Hoosiers. With me today, gosh, I'm so excited about this. With me today is Mr. Brad Long, who played Buddy. Now, if you don't remember who Buddy is in the movie, let me refresh you. When I say this word, you're going to automatically remember who Buddy is. Denting. If you don't know now, then you didn't watch the movie. Um, but welcome to the show, Mr. Long. Thank you so much for being here today. I know you, uh, you're you on a busy schedule, but and we'll make it as quick as we can. But thank you so much for being here today. Jamie, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, and like we were talking about before... How big of an influence this movie has had on on uh, society, and, and how many people talk about how how great that movie is. Uh, growing up, you grew up in Indiana, right? I did. I grew up in a town called Greenwood, probably about twenty twenty five thousand, a suburb uh, south of Indianapolis, and uh, went to Center Grove High School. And uh, you know, growing up in Indiana, I, I've told people before, you pretty much shoved the basketball when you're right. in the crib, so. It's not much of a choice, but I wouldn't have had it any other way. I grew up in a basketball family, so it was awesome anyway. Yeah, you played at, played at Center Grove in, in high school, and then you actually went off to college, Southwestern College in Kansas. You had much success up there at Southwestern College. Yes, we. I have really good memories of my college days. We were in the Kansas Central Athletic Conference, real competitive conference there of all NAIA schools, and... Uh, you know, had uh, had some success. We were conference champions my senior year, and uh, we were in a really tough district, Stevie. We we couldn't get to nationals. We 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 go twenty and five my senior year, and can't get out of the district because we had four teams ranked in the top twenty. So uh, it's just really competitive uh, every year. We always fought for the conference, and really have good memories. A lot of good basketball there in Kansas. Even growing up in Indiana, boy. Uh, Indiana's got nothing on Kansas with all the uh, colleges there and the JUCO championships, and it's another hotbed for basketball. Yeah, definitely two two basketball tradition states there. So, did, was there any other sports you played? I mean, I, I, I can't imagine. I, did you play football or anything like that? No, I, I did about everything under the sun up through junior high. did football, baseball, basketball. tried just about everything, but really concentrated on basketball in my high school years. I did run cross country and track and, and that helped me for for basketball really right uh, as well but basketball was my favorite uh of course of the three and that's where i you know i, I went on to play then in college and uh, but you know great years great experience in, in high school i had a lot of good memories of that leading into college and and then you know of course got involved with uh, hoosiers right after i graduated from college so it, it you know came on me pretty quickly there with uh going right from college into the movie yeah, so how, how does that come about now? You said right after you graduate college. How do you find out about uh, auditions or, or casting calls for Hoosiers? Yeah, it's a great question. It actually, there was an article in, in the Indianapolis Star saying that they were looking for 18- to 20-year-olds to portray these uh, this high school team based on the Milan story, and they were going to call it, you know, Hickory, Hickory Huskers. And I just really felt like I was too old to play a, a member of the team because I, you know, I was 23 but back then, I looked young for my age, and a lot of my friends say, man, you have to try out for that. And, uh, you know, I always tell people, most sports movies, they look for actors and hope they can play basketball, whatever the movie is about, football, you know, it's a football movie. This movie, they took a completely different twist. They looked for basketball players and hope, hope they could act. So they really took a chance <laughs> on the acting part of it. But, you know, they didn't give us too many lines, so we couldn't mess it up too badly. Yeah, and, and if I understand right, this was the first was it the first movie any of you guys were on the team made? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all of us were first-timers. We were just kind of nobodies from Indiana. All of us, though, uh, Stevie, had played basketball. That, that was the right. thing that we really take a lot, a lot of pride in. I mean, it was, it was they really didn't wanted to err on the side of the acting versus the basketball. 
authenticity. And so, you know, we made all of our own shots, and a lot of the footage you see is real. And not that we were great or anything like that, but we had all had some basketball experience, whether it was a high school level or college. And um, so, you know, that I think that helped. And then it was just kind of a cattle call uh, when we tried out for it, and they whittled it down to eight players. All eight of us were, actually seven of the eight, I should correct that, were Indiana boys, and then the, there was one actor that they uh, uh, cast as Everett. He played right. Dennis Hopper's son, and he was just a guy that he discovered on the beaches of California playing pickup ball, and he was the only one that was not a, a, a Hoosier, if you will. So auditions, you really didn't have to do an audition. I mean, they, did they just judge you by what you could do as far as basketball? That's pretty much it. The auditions were pretty much your basketball, Billy. We did a lot of drills and scrimmaging, and then they had us read a few lines. But I, I would say they ranked the um, acting portion of it second. They right. really wanted it to, uh, to be authentic from a basketball standpoint. Unlike some of the sports movies you see, at teen, I hate to pick on Teen Wolf, but I always remember that movie oh, with Michael gosh. B. Fox. And if you watch those players, Stevie, they're terrible. They're they're probably all good guys, and they're probably a lot better actors than, than we were, but they couldn't play basketball. And you could tell that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they didn't want Hoosiers to be like that. They wanted to be more uh, authentic from the basketball, you know, uh, authenticity standpoint. Yeah, it, it's funny you mentioned Teen Wolf because it was actually uh, on on TV the other day, and we were watching, me and my, my daughter and my wife, and I said something about the editing because one of the guys gets knocked down to the floor and is laying on the floor rolling around, but then they go to another shot of the bench. He's he's standing on the bench while he's supposed to be rolling on the floor. But, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. And the big kid, you know, my, probably a great guy, but the big kid, you know, they definitely did a lot of editing of his shots on there. So, yeah. first it the, did. And that, that, yeah, that's one way to do a movie. There's nothing much knocking that, but I just think if you're a sports fan, you notice that. You know, you look yeah, at it and say, man, these guys... You know, they, they show a guy shooting a shot, and then they just pan to the goal, showing the ball going in. And you pretty much can deduce the guy didn't actually make that shot. Right. <laughs> so what what was it like first day on the, on the set? Excited, nervous? I mean, you got all these guys. Did you, you instantly click with these other guys? Yeah, we, we developed a real camaraderie right out of the gate. They put us uh, all, all standing here. It was like a, it was like a fraternity. We, we roomed together and, and all that stayed in a hotel prior to filming, and we did that for about a two-week period, and I think they purposely did that so we developed some chemistry. And, you know, we, so we all stayed together filming. We didn't really get that nervous about it, and I'll tell you why. All of us had played basketball, and to, to us, I've always said the movie would have been about ping-pong or about bowling. I might have been in trouble, <laughs> but, you know, I was in my playing basketball, and to me it was just like a press conference from college. You really didn't think about the camera being on you, and so... From that standpoint, I think that took away some of the nerves. Right. Now, tell, tell me what it was like to work with uh, the legendary Gene Hackman. Great guy, down to earth. You know, you t people tend to kind of take these actors and put them on pedestals and think they're so much different than us, but they're really not. If anything, I found Gene to be a little bit shy off camera, almost an introvert, and acting was kind of his outlet. But a great guy, one of the most impressive Gene Hackman stories I always tell was, Here's a guy that could have come in and said, give me my line, show me my spot, and get out of my way. Right. Instead, he said, I'll, I want to go to some high school practices. I want to see uh, how they move, the verbiage they use, you know, uh, that type of thing. I, I was really impressed by that. Here's a guy who played Popeye Doyle and, you know, uh, Lex Luthor and didn't come in as a prima donna and said, I know my stuff, I don't need help. He did just the opposite. I've always been impressed by that with Gene. That's why he's so successful stuff like that i would imagine right how hard was it for you guys to adjust to because one of the things they they told you had to do was adjust to playing 50 style basketball no behind the back no between the legs or anything how hard was it and and the and the, the shot the way you shot the ball too how hard was that for you guys to adjust yeah that's a really good observation they they did tell us you know you need to realize this movie set in 1952 so we had to be real careful about our ball handling, and nothing against those guys in the 50s. They were very fundamentally sound, but you just hadn't seen a lot of the fancy stuff yet. And, right. you know, even Ray, Ray learned to shoot a set shot because the jump shot was just kind of coming in in those, you know, those early 50s days. And, and as Ray you learned to shoot a set shot, and the rest of us kind of, you know, try not to shoot a peak at, peak at peak of your jump jump shot. And, uh, you know, very fundamentally sound, but you had to be careful and kind of, 
kind of make sure that it was period, that it looked like, you know, realistic during that time period. Yeah. What kind of work days did you guys have on the set when you're filming? Was it like long days, or uh, how how did that go? Yeah, every day was different, but pretty much you were on set early. Uh, they, were, they were long days. You weren't needed on set every day because your scenes might not be being shot that day, so they were what you would call off days. Uh, but, you know, to me, I always describe people as movie-making, what I found is not a lot of glamour. Now, everybody thinks there's real fun and games and glamour and all that. It's a lot of waiting around, Stevie. It's like right. hurry up and wait. You might wait two and a half hours uh, on a scene that lasts eight seconds. Oh. And it's just amazing. <laughs> That's why they cost so much. Movies cost so much money. There's a lot of film ends up on the cutting room floor. You know, we were told later they had enough footage for another five movies. So you're talking ten hours of footage didn't even make it to the final print. Yeah, let's let's talk about deleted scenes while we're while we're on this subject because one of the things I always wondered when watching the movie from from the start and, and doing my research on it, you know, I I kind of got my questions a- answered. I did get my questions answered uh, because early in the movie, when things at practice aren't going exactly how you you guys want to, you're having a hard time adjusting. You decide to leave. You and another, uh, what's the other guy's name? that left with you yeah with, yeah, yeah. You, you guys leave and uh you quit and i see there is a scene where he comes back because his dad brings him in there but right. never see you come back but then all of a sudden at the next game you're playing again with no explanation why now yeah tell us tell us about that there was a there was a couple of deleted scenes that would explain everything to this right yeah, you're exactly right. And if you get one of the DVDs, there's a DVD out of Hoosiers that has the deleted scenes in right. it. It's like a two-disc. And one of the scenes, there's a scene where I draw, I've been kicked off the team. I do most of the mouth and off. He kicks me out. And then all of a sudden, I'm back on the team. And you're right. The critics and the media were saying, you know, how did Buddy get back on the team? Very confusing. <laughs> and so there's a scene in which would have explained all that. Where I drive up in 52 Chevy. I get out of the car. I walk into the barn. Or I have about a five-minute dialogue with Coach Dale saying I'd like a second chance. There's just about a five-minute dialogue. I made a mistake. I've been playing for Hickory my whole life. I don't want to be a certain tiger, blah, blah, blah. And it's about five minutes. At the end of the scene, he says, well, second chance is the last one you get. And he dismisses me, and I walk back to the car, and I drive off. That would have explained everything. But the people at Orion Pictures, which were the producers at the time, it has since, I think, been sold to MGM, but Orion was the producers. And these are the guys who sit up in the booth and say, this goes and this stays. Yeah. They felt like I looked enough like Jimmy at that point in the movie that audiences would be confused as whether it was Buddy or Jimmy getting back on the team, so they cut it. And, of course, the director to this day is still sick about it. He said they should never have cut that. We didn't look that much alike, and it would have channeled that gap as to how Buddy gets back on the team. So you're just supposed to assume that I straightened up and get back, but it's a hole in the film. There's no doubt about it, and anybody that knows me notices it. Yeah, and, and that's a huge hole. But as far as what their reasoning on that, didn't they think that the later scene at the the big vote, when Jimmy comes in and says he's going to play, Coach stays, I play, Coach stays, didn't they think people would realize that that's Jimmy there? Well, you would sure think so. And I know <laughs> the director and everybody. So, yeah, everybody associated with the movie. You know, and I, I have to be real careful because I don't want to sound like the prima donna. Right. But I'm upset because it was my scene, but it's not really about that. It's just that it would have channeled that gap. Yeah. It would have explained how Buddy gets back on the team. So, yeah, the director to this day will tell you he fought for that really hard. He he was upset that they made him cut that. Yeah. And he said it was the last scene cut, and uh, he always, when he sees me, always apologizes. I said, don't apologize. You, know, you tried, and I, I just feel bad because people, you know, always ask me about it, and uh no matter who it would have been, it's just that I was so vocal getting kicked out, it would have made sense to explain how I got back on. Yeah. Uh, five more minutes, and I, I've heard some people doing my research, people talk about five, the the length of the movie uh, with some of the scenes, but five more minutes with that scene would, would have made more sense, and, and would, you know, I don't know how you could make a better movie, but it probably would have, it would explain more, I'll put it that way. And you also... Yeah. Also, something that got left there, you you had a little bit of a love interest that, that got left on the uh, cutting room floor. Is that correct? That is correct. The only <laughs> other love interest besides Coach Dale and Myra Fleener 
was Buddy and Loretta. Loretta was the head cheerleader, and there was a couple scenes where I walk her to class, I carry her books, there's a real little, sweet little kiss scene where I give her a little peck before I get on the bus to go to the state finals. You know, even with little, little, little movie Hoosiers, they put a little, uh, a, a little mance in there with, uh, with one of the players, and that got cut out too. And I couldn't complain because, you know, she, poor, poor Laura Robling, who played Moletta, she got cut out of that. That was one of her big scenes, so I felt bad for her. Yes. But again, Orion ended up cutting things that wouldn't advance the story. They felt like that was just side, side stuff and wasn't necessary, so that's why they go cutting where they cut. But yeah, I was the only other, I had the only other love scene, if you want to call it that. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So t- let's let's talk about another character in the movie. One one of the most loved characters in the movie. Let's talk about Shooter, Dennis Hopper. How was it working with Dennis Hopper on the set? Yeah, it was wonderful. He was just like one of the boys, and of course, getting to talk to Dennis about all his background with you know growing up with James Dean, being in the movie yeah. Devil Without a Cause, and being in the movie Giant, and then you know of course Apocalypse Now, Easy Rider. I mean, it was so interesting to get to talk to Dennis, and you talked about a guy who'd been through a lot. You know, he told us that he basically missed the 1970s. He was <laughs> on drugs and, and all that, the drug culture in those those years. But the good news, he said he kicked all those habits and got clean and was actually counseling young people on, on uh, the evil. So he talked about second chances. He got one in real life. Right, right. Filming, filming the game scenes. Now, how, how hard was that to do? Was that pretty much scripted or were you guys just playing or was that pretty much scripted? combination of both a lot of the footage you see in the film is actual footage i can tell you a lot of the final game they rolled the ball out and said just play you guys try to beat each other and we'll keep some of the footage and they did uh other things were set scenes it just depended on you know at the picket fence right. that was a set play uh but as a general rule the thing i'm probably most proud of of all of us guys is because we had all played basketball it didn't take more than a couple takes to get a scene right, to, right. you know to make a shot or or, uh, you know, execute a play because we'd all play, you know. And so they didn't have to do a lot of takes over and over and over to get a, get a basket made or a, a play run, you know. Yeah, and, and like you said, a sports fan like I am, those some of my favorite parts of the movies are, are those game, the game scenes, just because it's so authentic, like you said. You guys were just out there playing. Uh, the game where Ollie makes the free throws at the end, uh, I guess that's the semifinal game. You, that... That's probably my favorite game scene, game as far as scenes go there. Uh, and that's also the, the, the scene, one of the scenes in that movie is what you're most famous for. What, how, what was it like with the whole denting scene? I mean, that really, really took off for you because everybody, when I say uh, it's the dent, I told everybody I was interviewing a guy from Hoosiers, all I had to say was, it's the denting guy. And they said, oh, it's Buddy. So I, that scene, was that improvised or was that in the script? No, oh, that was in the script, and what's interesting about that scene is, is you know, I'm the, I'm supposed to be the defensive expert. Of course, all my college teammates tease me about that. They only remember me playing the offense in the end of the floor. <laughs> so I get about that. But in that scene, I fell out, and, you know, he had, of course, Coach Dale had said, stick to him like chewing gum, by the end of the game, tell me what flavor he is. And I fell out, and I say it was 10 Now, what makes that scene work is Gene, the look on his face. Yeah. Like, you know, I can't believe the kid is serious. And he told me, TV, that was his single favorite line in the whole movie. So that meant a lot. Wow. Yeah, that, that should have been a lot. Yeah. That, that is one of the most known lines out of that movie, definitely. Uh, Barbara Hershey, uh, now she plays, the, I guess, the teacher out there. You never really hear what her actual title is, but I know she, she was involved in the school somehow. What was it like with Barbara Hershey on the set? Yeah, she was another one, real down to earth, uh, you know, real nice to me. Um, I, you know, there was rumors that she was unhappy with her character and was hard to get along with, but I never saw any of that. I, she was very nice to me, and I, I thought she did a great job. And, uh, you know, uh, if I have any, any criticism of that, I felt like she was a little bit too young for Jean. All the players got kind of a kick out of their little romance, you know, and Jean was probably, you know, I would say probably 15, 20 years older than her. Yeah. So we, we kind of got tickled by that, but you know, in movies, you got to get the ladies in the theater and, that usually requires some some level of romance, and uh, but Barbara was a real nice lady, down to earth. Of course, she had done a lot of work and and still works to this day. Right. Know? So and 
And then, of course, Dennis Hopper, the, really the big four were Gene uh, Hackman, Dennis Hopper, Barbara Hershey, and really a lot of people forget that Sheb Woolley, who Woolley, played yeah. Cletus, the principal, Sheb, Sheb was in a lot of movies. He was in High Noon with Gary Cooper. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, this is a good trivia question you can win some money on. <laughs> Sheb Woolley had a number one hit in 1957. Do you know what it is? No, have no clue. Flying Purple People Eaters. Flying Purple Sheb, People Eaters. Sheb Woolley wrote the song, A One-Eyed, One-Eared, Flying Purple People Eater. That went to number one in 1957. You have to Google that. Yeah, that I will definitely. Seven. I will definitely be looking that up after we get get through with this. Now, yeah, reading, reading some stuff on this, and I, and I, I really tried to research a lot. They, they, there was a rumor there was a lot of pranks on the set. Now, there was one that I read about uh, between you and Gene Hackman uh, about yeah. about some uh, dancing lessons. Your mom with dancing lessons. Yeah. You got that right, and, and looking back on that, I feel bad. You know, you're you're young, you're a young boy. You're, you're you know, you're uh, you're up to you know that age. There's all kinds of hijinks going on, and I kind of feel bad about this all these these years later. But the guys still remind me of it. Time at the time, it was funny. But we talked. Um, we they talked me into going up to Gene and saying, "Hey, um, actually, no, they talked Gene into coming up and asking me about how my mom's dancing lessons was." work was going and and gene did and i said well you know i i probably the best acting i did it the whole time i i got real sullen and somber and i said mr ackman i don't think that's very funny and my mother lost her legs in a in a, a farming accident oh my and god which, which which totally wasn't true and so he got this look on his face and the, and the guys just you know died about that but gene was a good sport he he knew he knew we you know we were playing a little prank and uh, gene was always you know good about things like that he he, nothing ever bothered him, but that was one of the pranks we did. I'm, I'm not that proud of that one. All these years later, but well, that, that was pretty. Time. I mean, yeah, it, it, yeah, at the time, it, was, it was kind of funny. Yeah, at the yeah. time, I could see that that'd be funny. Now, did you know much going into this about the Milan Indians? Yeah, we did. Growing up in Indiana, everybody, if you play basketball, you know about Milan. They still talk about it. it happened in 1954, and of course, I played high school basketball from '78 to '81, and even at that point. You know, whatever that would be, 23, 24 years later, you knew about it. Um, it. It's still really the last team that small in the state of Indiana to win a state championship when they had one class basketball. Yeah. And so that will live forever in infamy in Indiana basketball annals of history. And uh, they, you know, they still talk about it all these years later. Yeah, and and I did like to uh, the fact that. Two of the people involved with that team were in the movie. Uh, Ray Kraft was a Milan player, and he's actually the manager of the Hinkle, Hinkle Fieldhouse and talks to you guys when y'all come in, and it was the one that calls you out to the from the locker room to the court. And then you had the announcer Hill, Hilliard Gates, who was the announcer for that for the radio broadcast, the original radio broadcast. And when you look, you see him actually doing the radio broadcast on on the film. I did like the way they did that. That was pretty much a, a tip of the hat to that team to bring two guys who are involved with it back. Yeah, well, I agree. We thought that was pretty cool. I mean, those guys are our heroes. You know, we all these years later, we end up at events with them. You know, speaking engagements and and meet and greets and so forth. And we always remind them that we are there because of them. You know, they're right. always very gracious to us. And, talk about how, you know, they're so glad that we got to, you know, bring their story out and, you know, always singing our praises. And I, I always stop them in their tracks and say, you know, guys, you, you know, we got to play you guys. I mean, right. always remind them that we are here because of what they did. And they're such a great group of guys. Too. I mean, it couldn't have happened to a nicer group of men. I'll tell you, a lot of them are in their 80s. They're still alive and kicking and doing very well. Yeah. And one of the uh, another one of the great things about the Hoosiers movie, uh, especially during the the basketball the game scenes, the soundtrack. Jerry Goldsmith did such a great job with the sound that, it, a matter of fact, I was listening to uh, the I can't remember the name of the song, but it was from the most of the uh, game scenes they played there. Uh, just an incredible job he did with the game scene made made the movie that much better. I agree. Jerry Goldsmith is, is awesome. He, he, he's done a lot of soundtracks throughout the years, and actually, Hoosier's got two Oscar nominations. Right. One was for original soundtrack, which was Mary, and the other was Dennis Hopper for Best Supporting Actor. So, 
Uh, Jerry's soundtrack was wonderful. Uh, you know, and, and, and whenever you hear some of the music from Hoosiers, you know right away it takes you back to the movie. So that, that's always, to me, kind of a benchmark of how uh, influential a song and soundtrack can be when it makes you think of that. And that certainly does. Yeah, going going into the last part, uh, the last game, the champ- state championship game, uh, the locker room, and I talked about this with you before we went on there, the David and Goliath speech. Uh, now, I've I've got that speech. I've had that speech delivered to me before a game uh, once, and uh, goosebumps automatically popped up and and got me a little popped up. That was that had that was the perfect setup for this game. I don't know if that actually happened in the game or not, but if it did, it was just great. Had did did that kind of get you? That scene right there kind of get to you too. Yeah, it does. It, it's such a good analogy and metaphor with David versus Goliath because of the small team versus the big team, obviously. But it also showed kind of the uh, pre, uh, you know the Christian influence in the small right. towns, the ministers and, and the faith and family and all that rolled into one. I, that was really important to me, and I thought that was a cool thing that they included that. And yeah, I mean the writer Angelo Pizzo just man, I mean did his homework. You know, he just yeah. captured everything: the barbershop scenes, the, the prayers before the game, the caravans of the game, the the scenes at the school, I mean, I just, I give all the credit to the success of Hoosiers to those two guys, David Anspaugh, the director, and Angelo Pizzo, the writer. I mean, it, it, it Hoosiers would never have been done correctly or done justly without those two uh, being involved. And, and I, to this day, I give all of them the credit. Yeah, another one of the great lines from that movie is, is in the locker room when Coach Dale is talking to you guys about anything you want to say and, uh, of course, the small school line. Let's do this for, for all the other small schools that couldn't be here. Uh, delivered by uh, Kent Poole, who was uh, in in the movie. And uh, talk a little bit about Kent. How how much he meant to you? Uh, how close you were with him? And uh, you know, of course, he's not with us anymore. But uh, you know, talk a little bit about that line. And how much? Because I think that meant more to him. That small school line meant more to him than anybody out there. Yeah, I agree, Steve. Kent was Kent was awesome. He was my roommate throughout filming. He and I were very close, and I miss him every day. It was just everything about that situation was sad. He just kind of went into a black hole, yeah. is is what we were told with with his business, with his marriage, and you know, Kent was a guy that pretty much his whole life, everything he touched turned to gold. He never really had a lot of adversity in his life, and in some strange way, that sort of is what got him. You know, when things started, he started having a couple. Uh, you know, problems and issues with his marriage and with business, he just didn't know how to combat that. And, and you know, to this day, I just wish, you know, we would have known how much he was hurting and could have, could have saved him from that. But he was such a big part of the film, and that line encapsulates everything about the movie. You know, let's win it for the small schools and never had a chance to get here. Couldn't have been delivered by a more perfect uh, person than Kent because he kind of came from the small school in real life. And his, his story is really the... The story of Hoosiers. I mean, he he was perfect to play that part of Merle, and such a great guy. And, and I and I miss him every day. Yeah, and 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 guys, if you want to check out something that's really really powerful, uh, your son Landry actually did a movie called For the Small Schools about Kent Poole on YouTube. I just I've started watching. I just found it while we were maybe an hour before this interview. Uh, I've watched about half of it now. I'm in a small, small town. I'm telling you, we're a population of like 105, and we're still like in the 19th century with Internet connection. I don't understand how you can get Internet on a car, but you can't get it in a small town like the rest of us. So yeah. I'm sitting here having to watch buffering things to, up here trying to watch uh, watch this movie, but uh, I definitely will, will uh, post it on my YouTube, on my Facebook page, and so people can see that it's very powerful so far. What I've what I've seen of it so far, so you guys can check out called for the small schools. And your son was in high school when he did this movie. Yeah, I appreciate the plug. I'm really proud of Landry. He um, he has since gone on. He's a film major. He was wow. a good athlete. He ran cross country at uh, Taylor University. They were a uh, national power every year, and uh, he. Um, it always wanted to be involved with film, so he's a film major from Taylor, did an internship in L.A., and he's now well on his way starting his own production company. He did awesome. that as a junior in high school, and I know it's a dad talking, but I really think it's a powerful piece. He he took the Kent Cool story, and you need to know, he asked me, 
about doing that. He said, what do you think about doing it? I, you know, and I said, Landry, it's okay with me. It's okay with his family. Right. Let's get permission from him. And it had been 12 years since Kent passed, and they said, go for it. We, his story needs to be told. And Landry, my son, did a wonderful job of that. He divided up the story into four quarters, just like a basketball I, I game. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. Came up with all that on his own. And like I said, a dad talking here, but he's, he's talented. I, I think you'll read about Landry one day. He's, He's going to make it, I think, in that business. He's just got a lot of creativity and talent. Yeah, and what I've, like I say, I've seen about half of it so far. Uh, it's really great. Uh, guys, you really need to check this out. Okay, so let's get filming the championship game. It, you know, you said they, they just told, rolled the ball out and told you guys to play, play each other and, and we'll keep some of the shots. But that last shot, with Jimmy Chipwood, the last shot, now, how, did did that happen on the first take, or did you have to have a, a few takes for that one? Yeah, that's an interesting question, because I can tell you the background on that. That night, as good as Jimmy was, and his real name was Morris, Morris Valenas, who played Jimmy, he was a good player, but that night, Stevie, he couldn't hit the side of the barn. He just he was missing <laughs> that shot over and over and over. I remember Gene Hackman saying under his breath, we're going to have to move this kid in, we're going to be here all night. And I think that fueled, fueled Morris. I think he heard Gene say that. And I can tell you that when it came time for the actual takes, he made three in a row. Wow. And so I get chills telling you that story. But to us, we just felt like that was an omen. And I tell you, one of the reasons you see the crowd go crazy after he makes that shot <laughs> is they're, they're so happy he made it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a pretty genuine reaction, and it just couldn't have gone better. But that shows you what a clutch shooter he was when he needed to be he made him when they counted and so i always love that story but that's a true story yeah and i've heard now you you tell me uh steve holler who played ray butcher has has said that he actually won a state championship in high school and he said that reaction at the end was actually just as good he could not differentiate between Winning that and winning the actual state championship. That how was that feeling when the, the people rushed the court like that? Yeah, I love that story that Steve tells, and you're right. Steve was a uh, as a senior, won a state championship at Warsaw, pretty big school in Indiana, uh, his senior year. And so Steve was the only one of us that actually experienced in real life what a state championship feels like. And when he made that statement, it made me feel good that I felt like I, to some degree, got to kind of experience that through Hoosiers because. It was genuine. I mean, when that shot dropped in, everybody rushed the floor. And, and I think, actually, the one they took to France was the first take uh, of the three that he made. So, uh, pretty pretty cool. And, yeah, Steve would know because he got to experience that in real life. Yeah, it, it, just a just a great moment. And it still, still gives me, you know, like I said, any sports movie I, I can pretty much watch. And, and there's some of them I haven't really got into, but this one definitely got into. Uh did you guys realize how big an impact this movie was going to make? I mean, because we're talking now, what, 33 years now, and we're still talking about how great this movie is. People are getting in, new generations are getting introduced to it all the time. Uh, and did you realize how big of an impact this was going to make? Yeah, I don't think we did, Stevie. I don't think we had any idea what impact it would make. We, you know, ESPN, of course, keeps helping out our cause by <laughs> ranking it uh, highly. But I always give credit, again, to the writer and director. I really think they captured that time period. And you think about all the great sports movies out there, Brian's song, Chariots of Fire, Remember the Titans. I mean, go down the list. There's a lot of great ones. Just to be mentioned with those movies is humbling, you know. And, uh, no, I don't, think, I don't think any player realized what it was going to end up being all these years later. And it's just humbling to look back, and we can, you know we can't believe it's been 34 years since we shot that, but it has. Yeah, and I mean, you look at some of the things. One of the things I noticed, uh, July 2015, for your 30th anniversary, the Indiana Pacers wore Hickory uniforms. I mean, yes, <laughs> yes. The Pacers have been a big part of the Hickory story. They have embraced it, and they had all the players come out one night, had a Hickory night, and the Pacers have kind of. Um, you know, resurrected, you might say, or just kept alive, you know, the the Hickory spirit, and they do wear those jerseys on occasion and, right. and have a Hickory night. Pretty cool. I mean, the state has really embraced, you know, the success of the movie, and, and uh, you know, it's kind of a calling card. You know, you get people, we, the gym where we film the movie has become sort of a museum. You can go visit it now, and people come from all over to see the gym and shoot in there, and 
it's in Knightstown, Indiana, and they've kind of found their niche and made it into kind of a, a museum. Right. So, got to ask you this: your favorite favorite scene from the movie? I think I already know what it is. I'm doing my unless you've changed what you said over the past few years. I think I already know what it is. But favorite scene from the movie? Yeah, my favorite one really has nothing to do with me. It's it's the uh, scene in the hospital with right. Everett and his dad. I just love that scene. It, it 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 really is an emotional scene. It captures everything. It captures the meaning. Uh, of the small school, what it meant to the community, it captures the passion, you know, that that the uh, that shooter had uh, for the community, and, and the fact that it meant that much. I, I just love everything about that scene. When I watch it, it gives me chills, and I, you know, I, I guess I rank it my favorite. There's a lot of them that I have that are close, but that's probably my favorite. Yeah. So, are you still in touch? I know you guys get together. Are you still staying in pretty much good touch with all the guys? We do. It's, it's sort of increments of every five years. They always do five-year reunions. Uh, having said that, in between those five-year uh, marks, we usually get together at a speaking engagement or, uh, you know, something. NBA TV, for instance, had us all out to Inkle Fieldhouse a couple of years ago. We did a little sit meet and greet on for NBA TV. Wow. Uh, just things like that. But we still do keep in touch. It's amazing. You know, we'll, we'll always be uh, linked together because of that film. And it's kind of like your old college roommate. You may not stand for a couple of years, but when you do, you pick up right where you left off, and yeah. that's kind of the relationship we have. Definitely. And uh, how about what are you what are you up to now? I know you do some uh, motivational speaking. What do you do now? Yeah, I do. I, I do some speaking engagements with uh, my experience in that movie. I do some faith talks with churches and things like that because of my convictions. Right. And I'm a sales rep for Johnson's. I sell class rings, announcements, caps and gowns, diplomas. I have a territory in central Indiana. I've been doing that, Stevie, since 1985 wow. when I graduated college. I'm still doing it, and I still still really enjoy it. Johnson's is probably mainly known for we do about 85% of all the champions, Super Bowl, World Series, uh, NBA Championship, uh, NASCAR, UFC, Cathop, Robat, the list goes on and on and on. And so a lot of people know us from, from those rings. Wow. All right, well, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. First of all, thank you so much for doing this. This has been the fastest 40 minutes uh, I've, I've ever had on an interview. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Hopefully, I'm going to try to get some of your buddies. I'm going to try to get in contact with some of your buddies and get some more uh, of these guys up here for this. I'd love to have all of them that I could, but thank you so much, Mr. Long, for, for agreeing to do this. I know you've got a busy schedule. I'm going to let you go, but thank you so much. You don't know how much I've enjoyed this. Stevie, it was my pleasure. If those guys don't, you can't get a hold of them, you let me know. We'll get them on there. But thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure, and uh, go Hickory. Yeah, thank you so much. Guys, that is Mr. Brad Long. That's Buddy from Hoosiers. Thank you so much, Mr. Long. That's going to be the final score. Thank you, bro. You'll be good. You too.